Come on, let's welcome all the locations. We love you, Prison Church Network, all the Father's House campuses, Calgary, Canada, everybody on the stream. We love you, and uh, today's going to be a great day. Oh, it's so good. Turn to one person for your seat and say, it's really good to see you here. You're going to need this. I've been praying for you. Let's go to lunch. Whatever you got to say. Thank you, man. Oh, praise God. Well, we, uh, we are here today back in the Gospel of Mark, and I heard you guys had a great weekend. Last weekend, I was in Austin, Texas at one of our network churches, and uh, they had me preach five Sunday services live. So I'm refreshed today to only preach three. I feel a lot of energy and zeal about that. I'm highly caffeinated and full with the love of Jesus. So let's do this, amen. <laughs> Woo. Well, we are in Mark chapter 15, and if you don't know what that is, this is the moment where Jesus is arrested, he's tortured, and he's crucified. It, it is a, it's the crux, it's the pivotal point of the Christian theology, and uh, just a disclaimer as we jump in, a couple things, there'll be a lot of scripture today and some doctrinal uh, information. Paul told Timothy, teach sound doctrine, and so I, I want you to be clear on the doctrine of redemption today, and we'll use the word to do that. Paul also told Timothy, preach the word. Preach the word. Don't preach your opinion. Don't preach your preferences. Preach the word. Amen? So as we get into these verses, I'm not just going to read them to you. I'm going to preach them at you. And so the other disclaimer is this. I, I've been all week in this chapter and um, spending time contemplating, considering, worshiping around the theme uh, of Jesus going to the cross for me. And um, so if I get emotional, I am not working it up. If, if, I, if I have a moment with God while I'm talking to you, it's all good. You, you can't look to the cross of Jesus and consider his sacrifice uh, for a prolonged period of time without it doing something in your soul and your mind because the word of God is alive and it, it breathes life and it reveals things. So I, I, I received some fresh revelation of what Jesus went through and I've been preaching Easter sermons for 42 years and, uh, and, and the Good Friday where he went to the cross, but this week just a fresh download from heaven. So I wanna share with you and as we pick it up here in chapter 15, this is where Jesus spends the night in jail, okay? So just stop right there. I want you to think about that. They arrest God in the Garden of Gethsemane, and they take him to jail. They put him in what would be our modern-day handcuffs. I don't know what they did about a mugshot, but the creator of the universe finds himself in a prison cell, and the part that should shock us or at least cause us to consider the absurdity of this event is actually this. God willingly went. He spent the night in jail. You know, there's a, there's a verse in Matthew, his perspective of this on the night when Jesus was betrayed and, and he's out in the garden and, and they come in at night with torches and soldiers and um, Jesus said, hey, 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 I was with you every day in the temple teaching and you come to me like I'm a wanted criminal at night. And so Peter takes out his sword and he goes after one of them and all he gets is an ear. <laughs> Jesus says, Peter, put, a, put away your sword. Now, then he, then he makes this statement. I want you to consider this. And this is in Matthew. He's talking to Peter, Matthew 26, 53. Do you think I cannot call on my father and he will at once put at my disposal more than 12 legions of angels? Now, legion is a Roman military measurement of 6,000 soldiers. He said he could call on 12 of them. Where's my math people? How many angels is that? 72,000. We have a winner. Ding, ding. Okay, so just context on that amount of angels. 2 Kings 19, the Assyrians are attacking the people of God. God sends one warring angel and kills 185,000 Assyrian soldiers in one night. What Jesus was saying is, if I want to get out of this, I could simply appeal to the Father. He would send warring angels, obliterate the planet, and take me back home to heaven. The statement that Jesus was making is, nobody's forcing me to do this. I laid down my life willingly. I know the will of the Father, and I know this. It's time to fulfill the reason I came to earth. So Peter, put away your sword. So we'll pick it up here in the context of Mark 15, 1. This is the next morning. Very early in the morning, the leading priests, the elders, and the teachers of religious law, the entire high council, met to discuss their next step. 
They bound Jesus, led him away, and took him to Pilate, the Roman governor. And Pilate asked Jesus, are you the king of the Jews? Jesus replied, you have said it. Then the leading priest kept accusing him of many crimes. And Pilate asked him, aren't you going to answer them? What about all the charges they're bringing against you? But Jesus said nothing, much to Pilate's surprise. Now, it was the governor's custom each year during the Passover celebration to release one prisoner, anyone the people requested. One of the prisoners at that time was Barabbas, a revolutionary who committed murder in an uprising. So the crowd went to Pilate and asked him to release a prisoner as usual. Would you like me to release to you king of the Jews, Pilate asked, for he realized now that the leading priest had arrested Jesus out of envy. But at this point, the leading priest stirred up the crowd to demand the release of Barabbas instead of Jesus. Other gospel accounts said they cried out, give us Barabbas, give us Barabbas. And Pilate asked them, then what should I do with this man, the king of the Jews? And they shouted back, crucify him. Why, Pilate demanded, what crime has he committed? But the mob roared even louder, crucify him. So to pacify the crowd, Pilate released Barabbas to them. He ordered Jesus flogged with a lead-tipped whip, then turned him over to the Roman soldiers to be crucified. This was known as a flogging. And just a few things about the Roman flogging. It was, it was a brutal way to punish a prisoner. But as you study it and look at it, Pilate did not want Jesus to go to the execution of crucifixion. His wife had had a scary nightmare or dream about Jesus the night before. And so Pilate's trying to get out of this. He said, this man has committed no crime. And at one point when they insisted crucify him, he asked for a basin of water and he washes his hand. He says, the, the blood of this man is no longer on my hands, but it's on you. And they said, let it be upon us and upon our children. And it's believed, though, that Pilate asked for the flogging in hopes that this brutal punishment would appease the crowd so Jesus would not have to be executed. So the flogging was done with a particular whip called the cat of nine tails. And on the end of the whip, there was nine strands of leather about 18 inches long. And tied to each strand of leather would be a piece of lead or a shard of glass or a hook. And these, these items would rip the flesh out of the victim. And the 39 lashes was all the Roman government was able to apply. By historians' count, 40 was considered a death penalty. So many of the criminals, murderers and thugs that were, were beaten, insurrectionists, they were, they were beaten with the cat of nine tails. They didn't survive the beating. They never made it to the crucifixion. So Jesus takes this brutal beating and he goes to the cross. Now, in this chapter, okay, this is the crux of the gospel that we're looking at. What we're talking about is the great exchange. All that Jesus went through, he went through it for me. He went through it for you. This is the gospel. You know, I, I flash back to being raised in church. We used to sing this song uh, up in Oregon in, in my church days as a youngster. <laughs> and it was kind of, a, kind of a boom chuck song, right? But the lyrics were powerful. It was this, he paid a debt he did not owe. I owed a debt I could not pay. I needed someone to wash my sins away. And now I sing a brand new song, Amazing Grace. Christ Jesus paid a debt that I could never pay. That is the essence of the gospel. That is the message of the cross. Now, there's a theological phrase to explain what we're diving into today, this great exchange. And the exchange is this. It's his captivity for your freedom. It's his shame for your new identity. It's his personal torture for our healing. It's his blood for our forgiveness. This theological term is substitutionary atonement. If you just bring that up, here's what it means. Jesus' sinless life and poured out blood became the perfect sacrifice to atone for the sins of humanity, reuniting us with the Father. That is, now you've learned some theological doctrinal statements today, substitutionary atonement. And here's the reality. We were all separated from God. The fall separated us, then sin separated all of us from God generationally. You were born into a state of separation. And we know children are born innocent. There is an age or stage of accountability. But we grow up and we are shaped by the iniquity and sins of our parents and grandparents. We grow up in separation. That's why everyone must be born again. But this word at one you could actually break it down, atonement, to at one 
What Jesus did is he brought us back to one man or connection, unbroken relationship with the Father. And only the spotless blood of the Lamb could perform this. And it's all by grace. This is the essence, the core belief. It's only Jesus. It's not Jesus in works. It's not Jesus in religion. It's not Jesus in meditation. It's not Jesus in self-help. It's Jesus alone and his great grace. This is the gospel. John 10, 9, Jesus said, I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he'll be saved. John 14, 6, Jesus answered, I am the way, I am the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Now, this is the non-negotiable bedrock, non-negotiable bedrock of Christianity, is what Jesus did, that he is the only way to the Father. And it separates what you believe from every other cult. People say, well, you Christians are so narrow-minded. No, we're just following Jesus. And he said, wide is the way that leads to destruction, but narrow is the way that leads to life. And he is that narrow way. And we've chosen to say, I believe Jesus to be truth and every other man to be a liar. And that's how I'm going to live until I see him face to face. Now, there's a lot of dead religions and cults, and I could spend an hour going through these, but let me compare just three of them for you. Humanism or secular humanism teaches that we are all evolving into better and better versions of ourselves. We do not need a savior because we are the ones who determine our destinies and bring completion to our lives. How's that working out for humanity? (laughs) Not so good. How about universalism? Teaches that everyone will be with God for eternity regardless of their particular faith. There are many roads or ways to God, including Jesus. Uh, Your personal road or way could be the God of Islam, the God of Christianity, or any religion which establishes fundamental moral laws through a religious system. Uh, Another deceptive lie in universalism and every religion, religion that embraces that philosophy. How about Mormonism, one of many well-crafted cults? Like many cults, Mormonism believes that salvation is a combination of redemption plus works. You don't get to God without getting your works in order. But the main deal breaker as you dig into Mormonism, they do not believe that Jesus was the only begotten son of the Father. They actually believe and teach, and they've layered their teachings and cloaked them, but they teach and believe that Jesus was a created being being, and a spirit brother of Lucifer. But the point I'm trying to make today is it's a works-based religion. And if you examine cults, it's really around you earning your way, you keeping the rules and doing your thing and paying the money, whatever that might take. Now, here's a scary stat. Let me share this with you. Over 50%, latest Barna research results, over 50% of church attending people who identify as Christians, that's y'all, they believe that you will go to heaven if you are a good person, that that's enough. Let's just be clear, that's a lie. That won't get it done. So here's your doctrinal moment. Everybody ready, all locations? I want to give you some just real bullet point. This is the biblical doctrine of redemption. Ready? First of all, we have all been separated from God because of sin through the fall. Romans 3, 23. The wages or consequences of sin is death. Romans 6. We cannot save ourselves from this plight and destiny. Isaiah 64, 6. Our good works or high morals will never produce redemption, Ephesians 2. And without the shedding of blood, there is no removal of sin. And last one, only Jesus' substitutionary death on the cross can pay the penalty for our sins. Now, those will be online. They'll be in your small group discussion. So you can get these and and read through the scriptures. Here's what I'm asking you as your pastor. Get the doctrine of redemption solid in your spirit. And here's what you're going to come to. It's good news, bad news. Okay, bad news first. Bad news, good news. The bad news is you're toast without Jesus. The bad news is I'm separated from the Father and I can't get back there without Jesus. The good news is the great exchange. The great exchange. This is the good news of the gospel. Now, this is not an all-inclusive list. I stopped with six of them. I'm going to give you six points of the great exchange in the next few minutes. But you know, six is the number of man. So it's a good number to stop on. So fallen man, Jesus becomes a man. He's one of his titles, son of man. And he redeems humankind because of the great exchange. The first one, the great exchange, his shame for our new identity. He took shame so you could have a brand new identity. Now, It tells us in Hebrews that he bore our shame. He carried our shame. 
And, and the accurate translation of that verse is, he carried it away. It's a picture of the scapegoat in the Old Testament. The priest would lay their hands on this little goat and impute or impart, put on this little goat all the sins of the people, and then they would send him out in the wilderness never to be seen again. When Jesus carries your shame, it's not for a weekend or to cover one of your bad moments in life, one of your greatest regrets. It's to carry your shame away never to be seen again. But in order to carry that shame away, he had to carry that shame on the cross. Let's continue in Mark 15. The soldiers took Jesus into the courtyard of the governor's headquarters, called the Praetorium, called out the entire regiment. They dressed him in a purple robe, and they wove thorn branches into a crown and put it on his head. Then they saluted him and taunted, Hail, King of the Jews! They struck him on the head with a reed. They spit on him, and they dropped to their knees in mock worship. When they were finally tired of mocking him, they took off the purple robe, put his clothes on him, then they led him away to be crucified." Now, there's more about the shaming of Jesus in the other three Gospels, but to sum it up, here, here's what Jesus carried in the way of shame. He was stripped naked in front of his fr fr family, his friends, and the watching world. He was hung on a cross, the most shameful death in Roman history. People cursed him and jeered at him while he hung there for six hours. The leading priest yelled at him, hey, you saved others, let's see if you can save yourself. He was mocked, ridiculed, spit on, beaten, laughed at. And he carried it all away. Now, here's why this is important for you. Shame is a condition of our soul that can shape our identity. Yeah. Now, shame is different than guilt. Guilt is a gift that informs your conscience that something is wrong and you need to deal with it. So guilt is a good thing as long as you take it to the right place. But here's what happens with shame. It becomes our identity when based on our sins, our failures, our losses, our regrets, we believe that we're flawed and we're unworthy, and we carry a title over us. Divorcee, bankruptcy, addicted, did time in the pen, whatever your shame is, and we carry that as who we are. And I wanna tell you today, you are not the shame that's on your life. You are who God declares you to be. You know, the, the Greek word for shame, I thought this was interesting, the very word means a condition of disgrace and dishonor that brings confusion. So when you're carrying shame on your life, you're confused. Oh, I'm not worthy of that. I could never lead a small group. I could never remarry again because I'm confused about my worth because shame is owning my identity. And Jesus comes and says, I'm breaking that off of you. Amen. Now, life has a way of putting shame on you. We all got a past, mine is sketchy, so is that guy's. <laughs> and if you're not careful, people, and maybe you've heard this growing up, maybe it was your parents, I hope not, but an uncle or a, a cousin or, you know, probably a teacher somewhere, and they said this, shame on you, shame on you. They put shame on you. Let me just say, everybody lean in. If you have ever said that or you're saying that to your children, stop right now in Jesus' name. When you say shame on you, you know what you're doing? You are the voice of the accuser, all right? You are speaking for the devil because God doesn't put shame on anybody. Amen? That's a take-homer right there. And he carried your shame so you could live with this new identity. Look at this, 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. So today, step into the great exchange. If you're carrying regret from your past, that voice that says you're not worthy because of that, I want to declare something over you right now. You ready? Shame off of you in Jesus' name. Shame off you. Shame off you in Jesus' name. Be free of that. Number two, the great exchange, his stripes for our healing. Jesus took 39 lashes according to the prophecy of Isaiah. In fact, it's a deep dive study, but everything Jesus went through in this 36 hour period from the time he was arrested was so that he would fulfill all the prophecies of the Old Testament. Isaiah 53, some 750 years before this moment, said he was pierced for our rebellion, crushed for our sins, he was beaten so we could be whole, he was whipped so that we could be healed. And fast forward, after Jesus had ascended to heaven, Peter said this, he personally carried our sins in his body on the cross 
so that we can be dead to sin and live for what is right. By his stripes, you are healed. Now, that is sound theology. That's why we pray for healing. Just a moment on this, because we could do a full study on why people don't get healed and why some do. But here's the thought. Some healing is instant. It's an event. Others, it's progressive. We just keep praying and do what Jesus told us to do. But the healing that he took the stripes for is more than physical healing. It's for the healing of your soul. It's for the healing of your emotions. It's for the healing of your relationships. So let me just encourage you, no matter what state you're in, physically, mentally, emotionally, relationally, just walk close to the healer. Stay close to the healer. And maybe you won't see your full healing in the next month or year, but I guarantee if you'll stay close to Jesus, you will be fully healed and restored because that's who he is. Amen? Number three, the great exchange, his crown of thorns for our peace of mind. One of the greatest epidemics in the planet right now in the culture you live in is stress and anxiety and fear. Right down to our middle schoolers, high school suicide rates have plummeted in the last five years and people need some peace of mind. But true peace only comes through Jesus. So what they did is they they took a a crown of thorns and they, they twisted it and they put it on his head. And when, you, when we think of thorns, maybe you think of the, the rose bush in the backyard. But a, a few years, many years ago, one of our trips to Israel, went with some good friends, and we found ourselves in the Garden of Gethsemane, and we're talking to the gardener. And so we found ourselves in a, in a no-access area behind a gate, and we're walking and talking with the gardener. It's pretty cool. And we ran into these thorn bushes, which turned into thorn trees. And so we asked him if, if we could take one with us, and he took his snips and gave us some thorns. So this is, this is the small version of, of the thorns that grow. Now, these are indigenous, if you can get a close-up of that. These are indigenous in the Garden of Gethsemane, and the gardener told us these would have been the trees that they came and got the, the, the thorns for the crown of thorns. When these are fully grown, they look, they look more like this. Yeah. So I want you to see this just for a moment. That Jesus, when the crown of thorns was pressed down on his brow, it entered his skin and his scalp, ran through and and came out the other side, piercing him and the pain and the the swelling. And, you know, it says in Isaiah that he suffered so much punishment, the the rod that beat him, that you couldn't even recognize who he was. And you might be asking, Dave, was all this necessary? All the blood and the gore? Are you kidding me? Did Jesus have to go through that? My answer is absolutely. We don't understand the mystery of it, but we know this. Jesus has an idea of what he's gonna face. He knew all the biblical prophecies. He embodied the word, and he's in the garden, and he's under stress and anxiety. There's a medical condition where he was under so much stress and pressure that his pores began to exude drops of blood. He sweat blood. And in that moment, he looks to the Father and says, Father, If there's any way that this cup of suffering, this event I'm stepping into, can pass from me. In other words, if there's any way around this pain and suffering, and we can still redeem back fallen humanity, can I take that route? Because he was fully God, but he was fully man. But then he ends the statement with this, nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. And yeah, there is is some blood and some gore involved, and uh, I flash back to this moment. It was probably 15 years ago. And we were in the other location, and we'd done six or seven or eight Easter weekend and and, uh, Good Friday services, and I was all preached out. And I went to the gym, and I'm at the gym, and there's a conversation happening a few machines over that I eavesdropped on because I heard someone talking about they went to the father's house. And this lady was irate, and she said, ah, they're talking about the mutilation and the crucifixion and bloody Jesus, and she was using all kinds of boop metaphors to describe our service. And so I just kind of put my head down and did my reps, you know, because I thought, and there's the preacher, crucify him. (laughs) And unlike Jesus, I would have sprinted from the gym. (laughs) But you know, as, as I listened to that, it just, it did something in my heart. There was like a grief and this, actually this verse popped up in my spirit in, in in that moment. It's 1 Corinthians 118 in the Amplified. The message of the cross is foolishness, absurd and illogical to those who are spiritually dead and headed for destruction because they reject it. But to us who are being saved by God's grace, it is the manifestation of the power of God. I hope today 
that as we talk about what Jesus did and the price he paid, it's not foolishness to you. You recognize this is the power of God that redeemed my life, healed my body, saved my soul, gave me peace of mind. How many are grateful for the cross today? The cross of Jesus Christ. Isaiah 53, 5 says the chastisement, the punishment inflicted that brings us peace was upon him. So lean in today for every anxious person, for every depressed person, for those of you who wake up with night terrors and mental anguish, anguish, I want you to embrace this, that he made an exchange so that you could experience Philippians 4, 7. Look at this. You will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will what? It will guard your hearts and your minds as you live in Christ Jesus. Number four, the great exchange, his abandonment for our inclusion. Matthew 27, 46, about three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, and the pronunciation is something like, Eli, Eli, lama, sabachthani. And he cries this out, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? One of the seven statements from the cross. And in this moment, the word tells us, Jesus, who was sinless, became sin for us that we might be made the righteousness of God in Christ. Another theological term, imputed righteousness. When Jesus became sin, he earned the right to put his right standing upon you. And in this brutal moment, God turns away. God turns away. Now just lean in. All the sin, all the debauchery, all the human trafficking, all the abuse, all the sin of all humanity for all time was upon him in this moment. He became sin. And when he did, a holy God looked the other way. In Psalm 22, Jesus quotes, did Jesus see this coming? We've talked about this. He abdicated his omniscience when he said, I will walk this planet as a man. Perhaps he was shocked in this moment that his own father turned away from him. It's brutal. Utter loneliness, utter abandonment, the embodiment of sin. This is what Jesus did. Why? So that I can be included. He faced utter loneliness so you don't have to face loneliness ever again. He says he's a friend that stays closer than a brother. He's the comforter that fills you and walks alongside you. He'll be with you in the darkest night. Why? Because he exchanged his isolation for your inclusion. Come on, somebody. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. This happened so we would be made acceptable and placed in right relationship. You get to go where you could never go because of what Jesus has done. You get to walk right into the presence of the Father. Number five, here's the great exchange. His nails for our sin. Look at this in Colossians 2. He forgave our sins. He canceled the debt, which listed all the rules we failed to follow, and he took them away, took the charges away that were against us. How? By nailing them to his cross. I want you to get this. All of your failure... All of the rules we broke, the law we could never keep, our worst days nailed to Jesus on the cross, taking them out of the way. This is the great exchange. And the final one, number six, his life for ours. His life for ours. Now let's, let's circle back to this guy, Barabbas. Barabbas was a murderer. It's, historians say he caused a revolt. His name actually means a son of God. But he was a son of God that used the sword. He was a son of God that tried to take the throne by power. And there's, there's some irony there in juxtaposition of Jesus' way of going to the throne. But when they called for Barabbas, they went to him and they, they let him out of the cell. Now, he's on death row. And when they let him out of the cell, perhaps, speculation, conjecture, perhaps he caught eyes with Jesus. Here's Jesus going in and here's Barabbas coming out. And Jesus went and died on a cross that was meant for Barabbas. Now, what does that mean to you and me? Let me tell you, I'm Barabbas. You're Barabbas. That, that was my penalty that Jesus took. And it was his life for my broken life. This is the power of the gospel. This is what God has done for every one of us. One of us. And I wanna remind you again that love was the motivation. 
God so loved that he sent his only begotten son, knowing that the cross was the ultimate destiny of Jesus' brief life. Look at this in John 10, 18. No one can take my life from me. This is Jesus. I sacrifice it voluntarily, for I have the authority to lay it down and to take it up again, for this is what my Father has commanded. You know, it's been said that nails didn't hold Jesus to the cross. His love for you and me is what kept him there. I believe that. And then at the end, he finally, he cries out. You know, he says, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Don't hold this charge against them. And finally says, it is finished. And he gave up his last breath. And this is the finished work of the cross. The finished work of the cross is the great exchange. And as he said, it is finished, another amazing thing that happened was that veil in the temple was torn from top to bottom. And Jesus looks at each one of us and says, now, right now, you have access to the Father. I just tell you that access to the Father is not something you await on Judgment Day and the great white throne judgment when he says, enter in, good and faithful servant, to the joy that is set before you. And yes, I long for that day. But you know what? You can enter in right now. When that veil was torn, we can know him today. See, you're living eternity as we speak. You're just going to shift locations here in a few years. You're in it right now. You are an eternal being, and you're going to spend that eternity somewhere. I would encourage you, access God in this moment. Don't wait for a better opportunity. I'm going to ask the band to come up because I want to ask you, my final question would be this. What is our response to the great exchange? The great exchange prophesied in Isaiah. Look, look at this. Last verse. He will give you a crown of beauty instead of ashes. He will give you the oil of joy instead of mourning and a garment of praise instead of despair. What a program, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> so what is our part? We got to bring it. You have to bring the ashes of your broken life and he will make something beautiful out of it. What do ashes represent? The useless remains of something that used to be. Maybe you've got some ashes from a broken marriage. You got some ashes from addiction. You got some ashes from sin and shame. And, and, you're, and he says, hey, hey, if you bring those, think about this. Only at the foot of the cross are your ashes of any value. He says, if you bring those to me, I will give you a beautiful life. But you got to bring it. There is a response to what God has done. Bring him your regret, bring him your mourning. You know what he says? I will give you a garment of praise. He will wrap you in a robe of righteousness. He'll put a new song in your heart. But you gotta bring that anxiety. You gotta bring that thing that causes you, your, your stomach to turn when you think about that event or failure in your life. You don't live with it. You bring it to him and he says, give that to me and I'm gonna put some praise around your shoulders. I'll put a new song in your mouth. And finally, let's bring him our sin and shame. He's not embarrassed by it, not surprised by the worst thing you've done. And he waits saying, if you bring it to me, I'll exchange your broken life, your imprisoned life of Barabbas, and you will go free. Anybody grateful for the cross today? Grateful for the great exchange. This is chapter 15. This is the essence of our faith. Let's bow our heads. In other locations, we'll move into a ministry time in this room. First, first off, let's reverence the Holy Spirit as people are thinking through the ramifications of the, the cross for their own life. If you're in this room and you're carrying anxiety, stress, you, you just have mental anguish, in just a few minutes, we're going to open up a ministry time. And I want to ask you to come and bring the morning, bring those things that are on your mind and literally walk down an aisle and say, today I'm laying this down. Today, if, if you're carrying shame, Today, I ask you to enter into the great exchange. Just bring it all to Jesus, and he's going to take it, and he's going to carry it away. My prayer is this, that you will never carry shame for that thing in your past ever again. And when the memory comes, you'll immediately look to Jesus and say, at the cross, this has been dealt with once and for all. And with our heads bowed, if there's anybody here at, at this service, you say, Pastor Dave, I'm here in the gospel, but I'm not right with Jesus. I know he is coming back. I believe he will return and I'm not ready to meet him. If that's you, I wanna give you a clear invitation on this Sunday to say yes to Jesus. And I, I believe that you hung on that cross. I believe you died for the sins of mankind and I want you to be my savior. If you are here and you're not right with God, if you're away from God, 
If there's any question in your mind that you're ready to stand before him on that day, why not say today, Jesus, I give you everything, all of it. And this is between you and him, heads are bowed, believers praying, but if that's you today and you need, you need salvation, would you lift your hand, just wave at me, say, today's my day, I'm coming home. Just don't be shy, all over the room. Here and here, thanks for waving. So over here, here, here. If you're up top, just wave at me a little bit. Come on, let's honor the Holy Spirit in this room right now, here and way up top over here. If you're in one of the side rooms, you can respond as well. We're gonna conclude with a declaration for all those making this choice. And then when the altars are gonna open, the worship team's gonna sing. And if you have shame or anxiety or regret, bring it to the altar today. What we're gonna do in our final moment is declare Romans 10, 9, and 10, that when we believe in our heart and confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord, salvation comes to those that need it. So repeat after me with some passion. Dear Lord Jesus, today is my day. I'm coming home. I thank you for the cross. Thank you for suffering for me. Thank you for taking the stripes. Thank you for taking the nails. Today I receive you as my Savior and Lord. I ask you to forgive my sin and make me your own. From this day forward, I'm going to follow you till I see you face to face. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on, let's give the Lord some praise for his goodness. Let's stand to our feet. I'm going to ask the prayer team to come. If you need prayer, don't be in a hurry. We love you guys. You have an amazing weekend.